life principles from the garden. Yes. And the, the more we dig into it in all honesty, the more I am mesmerized and I'm confounded, first of all, about myself. Mm. Because as, as we dig into the text, I am finding so many things about myself that leaves me disturbed. Mm. That's not a bad thing. We ought to be disturbed. Because as long as you become comfortable, you stop growing. And if you stop growing, then you start retrogressing. So the, the challenge for all of us is to be constantly examining ourselves where are we not, where we ought to be at this point in time. And so um, a lot of stuff has been happening domestically, globally. For all of us, and if we are paying attention, you would observe some things that hopefully, by the grace of God, I have observed. And so what I'm about to share with you now by way of introduction is not a political statement, but a spiritual concern. Amen. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's not a political statement. It may sound like that initially until you hear what I say just take off your political affiliation and hear what I'm saying from my heart. So, two contenders for the Republican presidential nomination. Nikki Haley versus Donald Trump. Past year went, no, I already said I'm not talking about politics. Right? So just, just get rid of your political hat and hear me. Nikki Haley versus Donald Trump. She wants, Nikki Haley wants to be defined by her policies and her record as a governor. Right? Mm -hmm. He is attacking her at a personal level. Mm -hmm. The majority of people whose votes they are both trying to win are not interested in her policies. They are interested in the mudslinging. What does that have to do with what we got to talk about today? Hold on. Haley must therefore choose whether she will give in to the desires of the masses and thereby lose her way or stand for what she claims to be a value and possibly by standing for what she holds as her value, lose to the former president. Where am I going with all of this? We too <laughs> have to make hard choices. Amen. Right? Choices that say whether we are students of Jesus or just part of the crowd following for the little material blessings that come our way periodically. Many evangelical congregations have chosen former President Trump over their pastors by voting the pastor out of office for speaking the truth about him not being a representative of God's kingdom. They are rejecting Jesus' teachings of love and sacrifice for each other for the ungodly comfort of idolatry. Father, in the name of Jesus, give us grace to hear with the ear of the Spirit what you're saying to us in this day and hour. In Jesus' name. How many of you notice I'm blinging today? <laughs> That's the reason why I'm talking today about the deceitfulness of blinging. <laughs> I, I had so many questions from my family members. Daddy, what is wrong with you? I said, it's okay. It's just for today. <laughs> okay, so, so the first thing that I wrote here, we, the new people of God, are finally being confronted with the reality that we have skirted around. As citizens of God's kingdom, 
we must determine to confront all other kingdoms and their rulers using only God's provision. What are God's provisions? The Spirit of Christ who lives in us and the logos of his kingdom. He has given us nothing else. There are no other crutches that we need. The Holy Spirit who indwells each and every one of us. And what else? The logos of his kingdom that we've been talking about. What becomes our challenge? Number one, not to quench the Holy Spirit. Number two, not to choke the logos of God. And that's what we're talking about, right? I wrote again, this is all me. Actually, let me be honest honest with you all. She locked me in quarantine all week. <laughs> so I couldn't come out the room. I, I was locked in there, and I, God just had me. Where he laid me beside still waters. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he put me to lie down in the green pasture. Yeah. So there I was while the rest of you were frolicking around the place. I was locked in green pasture. I was lying beside the stream of living waters. But out of that came what I'm sharing with you today. Right? We cannot straddle sides. Right? The parable of the soils demands that we take a critical look at ourselves. Not at my wife, not at my children, not at you, but at me. You need to stop looking at other people and look at, come on, self, right? The result must be that each of us firmly choose is a side. So that's how we know if we've taken a critical look or we're taking a critical look at ourselves. We have chosen a side, right? Either we stand with Jesus or we align ourselves with the enemy. There is no neutral ground. You're either on God's side or you're on the, come on, whose side? Your enemy's side, right? Once we choose Jesus, we must identify, confront, and vigorously reject those things that choke the growth of his kingdom's message within us. This is the only way for us to produce lasting and bountiful fruit. And, and, and to be honest with you, I've been wrestling all week about this whole issue of what the text means when it says to be unfruitful in the kingdom. And we'll talk about it today again because, like I said, I was, now, I did not have COVID, but she still locked me away. <laughs> Right? Yeah, you all see already, you all think she's easy going, but anyway, <laughs> ask my brothers who live here too, and you'll find out. <laughs> so last Sunday, we, we kind of spoke about um, the number one choker, as I call it, which is the cares of life. And today, what we want to do, we want to move on and talk about the deceitfulness of riches. And obviously, by the grace of God, next week we'll talk about what the text means when it speaks of the pleasures of life. We make a lot of assumptions about what the scripture means. And when we do, then we become judgmental because we are using our definition and not the biblical text to define what it is that Jesus was talking about. Right? Right? Let me read the text, and then we can talk from there, right? So, this is Mark chapter 4, verses 18 through 19. And here again, And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those, they are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the... Come on. Right? And the desires for other things. Now notice what happens. They do what? They enter in. Which means that at some point in time, these things, even if they were present, they were suppressed. 
But now that they've entered in, they're, they're gaining strength. Right? And so as they gain strength, as they grow, as they gain strength, they begin to choke, to throttle, to suppress the word. Now this, this is frightening. It suppresses the word, and what proves unfruitful? The word. In other words, the word is prevented from bringing forth fruit in our lives. Now, how, how many have ever quoted um, a text like, uh, he sent his word and he healed them? How many have ever quoted texts like that, right? Um, that, that the word of God is sure, it is steadfast, it is immutable, it is unchanging. And if God said it, he will do it. And if he spoke it, he'll bring it to pass. We're, we're notorious for quoting things like that. But how many of us are taking possession of the very word? See, when the word is choked, when it is throttled, what it means is that what the text says about you and about me is not allowed to come to fruition in our lives. We may witness other people taking possession of it, but we ourselves are talking about it, but we are not owning it. We see others becoming, and we are wondering, why can't it be the same for me? And then two, one of two things begin to happen to us. Number one, we turn and walk away. This thing is not real. We turn and we walk away. What's the common term that we use for that? Backsliding, right? We turn and we backslide. We go back to our former lifestyle. Now, this is not in my notes. This is just for free. Do you know what the second one is? The one that should scare the living daylights out of all of us. We become religious. We are carnal. We are fleshly. We are ungodly, but we clothe it with scripture. We have all the external trippings. Um, not trippings, but trappings. We're tripping, <laughs> but it's the trappings that I'm talking about. We dress right. We smell right. We look right. We sound right. But we are, Jesus put it another way when he spoke to the Pharisees. He said, you're like whitewashed sepulchers filled with what? Dead men's bones. There is no inner life. Here's how Watchman Nee put it. Watchman Nee once said in his book, Practical Issues of This Life. That's, you remember it, right? My favorite book. He said that many Christians leak their life away because they're constantly talking. God's got this. I'm too blessed to be stressed. Um, you all understand all the cliches that we use. He said, but there is no life in them because they cannot impart, impart what they do not have internally. See, this is the danger that we are playing with. So let, let me see now if I can get you going because all that is just the warm-up. <laughs> so principle number one, without God's values at the forefront of our actions, material wealth will only lead to unfruitfulness. Let us prioritize the logos of the kingdom above all else to experience the true abundance in our lives. Now, to be honest with you, part of this is me, part of this is um, AI, because I consult AI for my grammar, and when I find AI is changing what I'm trying to say, I just kick them to the curb and stick with what I'm saying. <coughs> so I'm just telling you up front, I'm giving AI a little credit, but the main thought comes from me, which I believe I got from the Holy Spirit. It is not by saying we believe, it is the obedience that belief produces which show what we believe. Should I repeat that for you? Yes. It is not because we say that we believe, it is the obedience that our belief produces that tells people and tells us what we truly believe. 
How many of you know we lie to ourselves? Come on. How many of you ever lied to yourself? Right? Now, now hear me, please. The heart is what? Deceitful above all things. And what else? Desperately wicked. And what does the scripture say? Who can know it? Right? The worst thing that we can do is lie to ourselves and we are all guilty of it. Do you know how many months I used to look in the mirror and see a slim guy with a six pack? <laughs> do you know, do you recognize why we need each other now? Because we need a dose of reality. Right? And it is the community that helps us to have reality. I want to tell you about Jackie and what she says to me, but anyway. <laughs> so, so hear me now. The longer a student continues in active disobedience, the greater they choke the logos of the kingdom and will eventually become unfruitful. Right? Do you realize I don't come and tell you all anything new? I haven't said to you all anything that the scripture has not been saying. What am I doing constantly? Holding the mirror up for all of us to see. Right? So, continued disobedience is the challenge. Um, this guy, David, what was his name? Anyway, he said this. Delayed obedience is still disobedience. Yes. Duck! All of you died. You realize that? Why did all of you die? Because you didn't respond. Your delayed obedience resulted in all of you dying. Can we go a little deeper? Amen. Right? <clears throat> Do you know why we don't respond immediately? We don't believe. We're not hungry. The logos has been choked in each of us. Listen to how God speaks today. Right? If you hear, do not harden your hearts. What is our argument? God, I know if this guy real. Look at how he lives in. And sometimes, because we pay attention to the messenger and not the message, we don't duck. And so we get bam. And when we fall flat on our backs, Lord, how, why didn't you warn me? But you already told us to do what? Duck. You see? The challenge that these believers were facing is that they were expecting some signs in the heavens. But he had already given his sign through his word. The point that I'm making is that if God wrote it for us, don't go looking for another revelation, which is where we again err. Well, I want to see wonders and signs and miracles. His word already said it. And when we reject the logos, we open ourselves to being led astray. Is this making sense to you this morning? Amen. So here's a question for you now. It's, it's not asking you to show your hand, but it is asking you to show your hand. <laughs> you know, I don't want you to put up your hands, but I want you to put up your hand. Right? Right? 
introspection. How many of us in here have been rechoking the logos of God at this very moment? That's the question only you must answer. So you're not putting up your hand for me to see. That's between you and the one who spoke to all of us, right? Now let, let me go so we can try and get some closure today. <clears throat> We're going to define the deceitfulness of riches because for me a definition is always important. It helps us to get on the same page. Now, first of all, how many of you understand that, that Jesus is not against people being rich? Right? Jesus is not against people being financially or materially rich. I'll just give you a few examples from my own head. How, how many of you remember Mary, Martha, and their brother Lazarus? <coughs> they were extremely wealthy. They were highly respected in their community. They were, very, they were very affluent. And Jesus used to hang out with them. Let me see if I can give you another example. Um, there was this guy by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up into the sycamore tree for the Savior he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed by, he looked up in the tree and said, Zacchaeus, come down, for I'm going to your house for tea. That's the Guyanese version. I don't know the American version. <laughs> now, Zacchaeus was extremely wealthy, and Jesus chose to visit him. So the issue, and I could give you many examples, the issue is not people having material wealth. So what then was Jesus really talking about? That's what we need to find out. Okay, so defining the terms and putting it all together. <clears throat> the word deceit, I, I, I was just blown away. <laughs> So the word deceitfulness refers to the pleasant illusion that comes from erroneously assuming that material possessions equate with our being right with God. Well, things must be going good between me and God because I got money. And I got a car and I got a house. Right? And there are many believers who choke the word of God because they have some material possession and they think that things are right between them and God. But, but notice what it says, a pleasant illusion. It's as though somebody is, is high on narcotics. That's what it's talking about. You know, when I've never been high in all honesty, never been drunk in my life except probably once that I recall. And that was by accident and it was not the kind of alcohol you are. Why am I giving all these explanations? <laughs> I must be feeling guilty. But anyway. <laughs> they say that when people get high, they lose a sense of reality and they're just drifting out there. Now, I don't know. I've never had that experience, nor do I want it. But it's an illusion, Right? Now, riches refer to the abundance of material resources or materials. You got plenty clothes. Um, how many of you got more shoes than you can wear in the week? No, don't show your hands. <laughs> <coughs> I should put up both hands too. <laughs> but, but do you understand what I'm saying? And, and, and we think that we got to get a shoe for each outfit and we got to get this and we got to get that. And if we don't have that, then we are not blessed. That is the pleasant illusion that having these things give us because now we are rich. Who says you are rich? The world says you are rich. God doesn't say that makes us rich. That is what Jesus is talking about. Now, I'm not saying to go sell your shoes. But if you want, sell it and gift anyway. <laughs> so, the, the word unfruitful refers to failing to produce useful fruit. Now, it is not failing to produce fruit. It is failing to produce what? Useful. 
Um, but when you do management theory, which would be like management 101 and so on, they talk a lot about information and the importance of timely information. It does not matter how much information you provide. It might be accurate and everything. What is the most essential thing for anyone who has to make decisions with accurate information? Timeliness. If you don't get it on time, you're wasting time. You see? And, and so on being unfruitful doesn't necessarily mean we're not producing fruit. We're just not producing the fruit in the season when it is needed. Is this making sense to us this morning? We are not producing fruit when? In the season when it is needed. Here is a glaring example. And, and the Holy Spirit just gave it to me. How many of you remember Jacob and Esau? Right? Esau, the hunter of the meat, the ear to the promise, came in from the fields and he was hungry. He had a prized possession that Kennard wanted. How many of you understand why I switched to Kennard right away? <laughs> because Kennard made this bowl of lentil soup. And so I came in as the custodian of the birthright, right? And I said, um, Ken, I'm hungry. And listen to the master manipulator, Kennard. Well, Ian, you got to give up your birthright, right? And then you can get a bowl of this lentil soup. Timeliness. Timeliness. Manipulators maximize on their opportunities and the children of God lose out on theirs because they have not positioned themselves to take hold of what God has given to them. To keep, to retain, to hold on to what God has given to them. How many of you understand what I'm saying to you this morning? You see? Why do we lose our blessing? Because we are choking the truth that God has declared over us. So, so then if we try to put it, I mean, I could say a lot about being unfruitful. Let me give you one more example. Can I use yours? No, I won't do that to you. <laughs> she looked at me and said, don't you dare. <laughs> but anyway, how many of us know that God says we should treat our spouse in a specific way? Right? And when we feel disrespected or we feel unloved, we reject the logos, and we choose the cultural way to operate. That is choking the logos. Can I, do I need to go deeper? When you choke the logos, what happens? It becomes unfruitful in whose life? In our lives. Because now we have sown that kind of a thorn. And now we got to go and try to pull up that thorn. And sometimes it's very hard. You got to do a lot of penance. Uh, well, please help me. Forgive me. <laughs> I guess all of you understand what I'm saying. So let, let's, let's go on. So principle number one. I, I've, I've spoken slowly like molasses dripping in your ears long enough. Principle number one. <clears throat> one can be deeply religious participate in all the rites of the local assembly, yet be ensnared by the deceitfulness of riches and therefore be unproductive in Jesus' kingdom. In other words, we can pray 24-7, 365. We can do all the religious stuff. Read our Bibles religiously, 
um, give to the poor and all of those things. But if the Word of God is not changing the way we're thinking and governing our lives, then our lives will be unfruitful. If, if I was to sum up what Jesus was saying in a single statement, it is this, that if the Word is not becoming in us and we're not becoming the Word, then our lives are unfruitful. Isn't that all of our state? But I, I, I must give you scripture to help you out. And so I, I want to go to this interesting encounter that we had. Um, Mark chapter 10, verse 17. I'll read a few verses, then we'll talk it through. Then I'll show you one other example. So this is the negative here, right? That the word is choked and the consequence. As he, Jesus, was setting out on his journey, Mark chapter 10, verse 17, the English Standard Version, a man ran up, and now, now notice carefully all the things that are taking place here. A man ran up and did what? Do, do you see that? That's intentionally included in the text that he knelt before him. To kneel before someone is to put yourself in a posture of worship. Right? Knelt before him and asked him. So he has come with a question to Jesus. Good teacher. What must I do to do what? So what was he concerned about? He wasn't concerned about this stuff now. This dude was thinking straight. This guy <laughs> was thinking straight. This young man had his act together, right? Because look what he's concerned about. He was not concerned about now. He had now covered. He was concerned about his eternal life. Keep that in mind. So keep in mind, number one, that he knelt. Religious act, he knelt. In worship, then he came with a very an excellent question. Most Pentecostals don't ask the question. They they got a chance to see Jesus, Lord, how must I? How can I be blessed? <laughs> how can I get out from being broke, busted, and disgusted? He wasn't interested in that. Lord, what must I do? Now notice, not what must I hear? What must I believe? What must I? Because he connected doing with taking hold of. Mm -hmm. Another lesson all of us would be good to learn. It is not just about believing. It must be accompanied with the correct kind of action, right? But, but I, I am holding you up there. So, <clears throat> verse 19. What did Jesus start off by saying, you what? What's the next word there? No. You know. So, in other words, Jesus is saying, you already have the knowledge. Right? You know the commandments. You know what is written. Right? You know what is written. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Right? The do's. Listen to this young man. He blew me away. Uh, verses 20 and 21. And he, the young man, said to him, Jesus, teacher, what else? Come on. He said some of them, right? No, he said all. This was the ordinary guy. Now, to be honest with you, if I was like a married and I was looking for somebody to hire, as soon as I saw his resume, I wouldn't even interview him. I'd hire him right away. He has what it takes. All these things I have kept from when? He isn't like our confused children today. No, no, not, not you all. <laughs> My confused kids when they were that age. He, he, he's, he is not like that. He said, all these things I have kept from my time as a youth. He ain't had no identity crisis. He ain't wondering if he's male or female or if he's something in between. He knew exactly who he was. He knew what was required. And that tells you something about the investment his parents were making in him. 
But again, I digress. I digress. And verse 21, Jesus looking at him. What else? Love. Of course. Who wouldn't love her? If, if I, well, I got one daughter, but if, if he was around and he said, Mr. T, I wouldn't even think about offering him the sugar cane test. Come, 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 let's talk. <laughs> Go bring your parents. But <laughs> Jesus in Ian Taylor, he is not caught by the superficial. He is not ensnared by the externalities. Jesus was after something else. Listen to Jesus. So Jesus looking at him, so constantly looking at him, he did what? He loved him. This is a good candidate. Has great potential. Merely hire him. Yeah. That would be me to her. Well, listen to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, You're lacking. <laughs> You're lacking. Don't worry with the lips, hips, and fingertips. Young Benny. Say amen. Good. <laughs> Jed. Say ouch. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you lack what? How many things did he lack? One thing. He had all this stuff going for him, and Jesus said, You lack one thing. Jesus did not quali disqualify him, though. This is the power of the logos of the kingdom. Because the power of the logos of the kingdom is in showing us what we lack and give us, giving us an opportunity to fix it. You see? So watch. He doesn't just say, you lack one thing, disappear from me. He tells him exactly what he needed to do to take hold of it. Watch the text again. Go. Don't, don't, don't sit down here. Don't cry and lament and say they don't like you because of your race and your gender and all them other stuff and, and all your other stuff. No, don't, don't waste time with that. Go and do something specific. Go sell what? Sell all that you have and what will happen then? And you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. <laughs> this is the power of the logos of the kingdom it forces us to stop looking at other people and begin looking at ourselves and then making a choice Let, let's go on because there, there's so much more here disheartened by the saying that's not Jesus no that's Jedidiah Right? Disheartened by the saying, what did Jedidiah choose to do? Why? Kevin Sito? Is he hearing me? Is he awake over there? Say ouch. Good. Young Benny's? Say, ouch. Should I call any other person? Just say, ouch, everybody. Ouch. Listen. And Jesus looked around and said to whom? Right? His students, right? How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to do what? Now, he did not say it's impossible. He said it would be what? Because of the deceitfulness of riches. Because I am me, I need to show you a few things. Number one, right? Important considerations. Number one, <laughs> he was a part of God's covenant people because he was a Jew, right? So he was a chosen part of the house of Israel. 
His understanding was stifled or choked by his rejection of the logos of the kingdom. Did he have an opportunity to embrace it? Yes. But is not the opportunity all of us have every single day? Right? He loved the he was deceived then by the deceitfulness of riches more than he loved Jesus. He did not love all the saints equally. He was biased in how he treated the people. You trust me, if Jesus had said, go give some money to the rich people, he would not have had a problem. What was his problem? Because they were who? Poor. Right? Um, in rejecting the logos, he departed from the kingdom. And what does the last part say? The very last sentence. Before we start condemning him, we must consider our own response to Jesus' command about how we prioritize riches. Should I? Shouldn't I? He loves me. He loves me not. <laughs> she loves me. She loves me not. Should I? Shouldn't I? Should I say it? Should I say it? How many of you say, say, say it, Pastor Ian? Say it, All right, y'all asked me to say it, so I'll say it. <laughs> Listen, if you, after all these years in the Lord, are still not honoring him financially, you're deceived by the deceitfulness of riches. <laughs> Let me move on now. <laughs> I, I got a little nervous. So here, here is what Bishop T.D. Jakes once said. Money, now, now hear carefully, money is innocuous. It is neither good nor bad. It is neither evil nor anything like that. It takes on what? Come on, it takes on what? Is not the devil who made me do it? Listen, if I got a bad attitude when I'm broke, guess what kind of attitude I'd have when I have a lot of money? Do you know why? Money just gives me license to become worse than I already am in that specific area. If I am stingy when I'm broke, Guess what would happen when I have money? Stingy, all right. <laughs> but do you, so money in itself is not the issue. It is the heart of the one that is handling or to whom it is entrusted. Now, do you understand why it is that God does not allow some of us to handle a lot of money? If you're asking yourself, well, why is it that I'm always gathering and it seems as though there's a sieve in my pocket and it's always flying out the other side, ask yourself if God can really entrust to us the riches. Do you know something that I've seen right here in our community of faith? The believers who are generous always have. Did you hear me? You check. There are believers who are always bringing something to share with everybody. They are always generous. And you check, they always have something to share. I won't say anything else. Um, thriving Wallets, this is from 2023. Here's what they said. The majority, 90% of Americans say that financial considerations have an impact on their stress level. And I would say that's true. What causes tensions in our marriage? What sends up our blood pressure? I, I could go on and on. When you got it, you're all right. And when you ain't got it, you ain't all right. Right? So we need to have money. But money does not need to have us. Anyway. <coughs> Excuse me. Change are more of the same. 
what are we going to do? Are we going to change or will we continue down the same path? Remember, repentance is all about change. But the change is not because I come to you and say, um, Jed, you need to change. Or Kevin Sita, you need, or any of you, you need. It's not because I am saying this to you. The question is, do you have such a relationship with the logos of God, of the kingdom of God, that when it speaks, you're not choking it. I'm not choking it, but I'm allowing it to work in my own life. If we keep stifling it, we will never grow. It don't matter which church you go to. It don't matter who preached to you. Jesus himself could come down here and sit down and talk to you, and you will not change because your intent is to choke the logos of God. See, some people say, well, the Lord got to tell me. Who do you think is telling you now? Not, not because he got a bald head and a brown skin. Hear the Spirit of God. Let him speak to you. Don't, don't see this person. You see? But learn to see the Spirit of God when he, and hear him when he's talking to you. Not because it's convenient for us. Not because the person is saying something that makes us feel good about ourselves, but whether or not what they're saying is the truth. Is it written in the text? Is it from the logos of God? If it is from the kingdom of God, if it is the logos of the kingdom, then forget the, the messenger, embrace the message. It is the message that changes our lives, not the messenger. Do you know God literally used a donkey to talk to his people at one time? Yes. I wonder how many here. Hee-haw, hee-haw. Would I help you to hear? <laughs> if, if that's what it takes to help us to hear, then hee-haw, hee-haw, hee-haw. <laughs> but let us hear what the Spirit is saying. <laughs> now you see why I can't stand up at it. <laughs> anyway, principle number two. Is it, let me finish it, please. Is that okay if I finish it? Good, good. So, <coughs> principle number two. True understanding of, somebody read for me, please. <coughs> At the end of the day. How do we know that we truly understand the text? The last word in the sentence. Repentance. Right? If you come and you tell me such a good word, Pastor, I enjoy listening to you teach. But you tell me, oh, you even bring some cookies and give, well, not cookies, but you make soup and give me and, and, and whatever else. Some bunjal, duck, no, not duck, I don't eat duck. But you understand what I'm saying? You, you do whatever it is you think that I like because you want to show me that you really appreciate what I share with you. But you are not repenting. You don't appreciate it. Are you hearing me? And what does the culture tell us? Give them a word of encouragement. Hear me in the kingdom of God. The word of encouragement is the act of repentance. That's a good tweet, right? In the kingdom of God, I can say it again for you. In the kingdom of God, the word of encouragement is the act of repentance. Not the word of repentance, but the act of repentance. Let, let me go quickly. So, we want to look at another guy who got an opportunity to hear the Logos. Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 3, um, through 2, first of all. He, referring to Jesus again, entered Jericho and was passing through. So again, he's on his journey. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was, um, had mucho, mucho, mucho dinero. <laughs> In Guyanese parlance, he filthy rich. Now, here's something that you might not have known. The word Zacchaeus means pure. The pure had become contaminated. 
right? The pure Zacchaeus had become contaminated. Why? So he was, a, he was not just a tax collector, but he was what? He was the chief. He was the Chubat. Yeah. Right? He was the boss man. So here, here he was. They were despised by the Jews because these were Jewish people who were working for the Romans. I think in, 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 the, in the military field, they would call them collaborators. And everybody hated the collaborators. Why? Because they were working with the enemy against their own people. Um, he had acquired, acquired great wealth by virtue of the job that he did. Remember, he was not just one of the guys. He was the chief. But he was also a covenant child who was walking in error. As he was seeking to see Jesus, who was um, on account of, well, what am I saying? And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was what? He was a diner. So, so, he, so he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to do what? For he was about to pass that way. Can I share a few things with you very quickly from this text? Oh my gosh. <laughs> this guy had a lot of obstacles against him. Unlike the rich young ruler who had ready access to Jesus, he did not. Why do you think he did not go into that crowd? He was in danger. Right? And I something flashed through my mind. <laughs> so, so his occupation, so he, he was a traitor to his people. And so he was always in danger whenever he was around them. There was a physical crowd, which means that they could have stoned him to death if he got into their midst. He was small in stature, and therefore he couldn't push his way through. Not like Beth, you're walking up and say, mm -hmm. and you just see my, you move out of the way. No, this was a diner coming. <clears throat> Notice he did not make excuses. How many of you see that? He had a goal, and he developed a plan, and he worked his plan. For him to get to that sycamore tree, that was his goal, right? Well, that was his main stepping stone because he couldn't get to see Jesus any other way. He couldn't go through the crowd. He knew there was a sycamore tree, and that sycamore tree was a stepping stone for him to see Jesus. What did he do? He had to leave home early. He couldn't wait till the crowd built up because the more people gathered, greater were his chances of being seen. So he left home early enough, and he made his way to that destination. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You don't get to any place by chance. You don't get it by sleeping late in your bed and all the other crazy stuff What uh, we do. He did not lie in his bed and say, Lord, help me to see Jesus. Let Jesus come to me. He took whatever action was necessary. He made whatever sacrifice was necessary to position himself so that he could see Jesus. Go, do something. Right, but let, let me go quickly. Um, verses 5 and 6. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down. Now, now notice, sense of urgency. Hurry and come down. I've said to you all repeatedly. Take care of the things God tells us to take care of is in the Logos. Because when God opens the blessing, he opens it how? Suddenly. And if you're not prepared, then you can't handle the blessing. If we are not at this point in time inculcating the disciplines that are necessary to manage the blessings of God, what word did I use? Manage. You want another word? Steward. 
If you're not disciplining yourself to manage or steward the blessings of God when it comes, you lose it. Why? Because you have not trained yourself. You have not inculcated the mindset that is necessary to handle the blessings when God gives it to you. In other words, we are choking the logos of the kingdom. We are deceived by the deceitfulness of riches. Or as Bethel put it one time, we're in love with the idea of success, but we're not in love with success. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, now notice what Jesus says. For I must stay at your house today. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you all a question. And this, this is how we spiritualize things. But my intent is not to stir you up. But to get you to sit down and think soberly. If Jesus turned up to you now. As he is. And he says to you. Merrily, hurry up and come down, for I must stay at your house today. All the blessings that Merrily has been crying for in her bed, weeping before the Lord all these years, this is her moment. Is she ready to receive Jesus? Is she ready to go with Jesus? If Jesus appeared to any of us at this moment, think of all the stuff you've been praying and crying to the Lord about. And he appears to you right now and says, Benigno, hurry up and come down. Now notice, come. Right? I must stay at your house today. Do you have to hurry home and clean up the house? You have to say, Lord, I'm I'm not in a position to receive you now. How many of you understand what I'm saying? Can can you hear what the Spirit of God is saying? Zacchaeus made preparation before. He made the preparation, not other people. He made it because he wanted to see Jesus. This is what the Logos of the Kingdom does. It helps us to be prepared every moment of every day for our encounter with the crowned king of glory. I know Bethuel. I'm getting there. Now, now watch. You see, you got to be willing. You got to have the intestinal fortitude to handle the blessings of God. Verse 7 of chapter 19. What does it say? Come on, what does it say? Let me ask you something. Did they say some of them grumbled? All of you does grumble when you all see me getting blessed. Anyway. <laughs> That's human nature. Can you receive the blessings of God while dealing with the grumbling and the rejections of the people around you? You got to make up your mind. Right? You don't get one and the other ain't coming with it. And so if you would go into the corner and cry, Lord, look how they're talking about me. Stop. Stop. Can you pay the price? There's a lot more I can say about that. And Zacchaeus, verse 8, stood and said to the Lord, Behold, now now watch this. This for me is the best part of it all. This is the best part of it all, verse 8. Lord, behold! Exclamation, right? Behold! Lord, who is he? He didn't say Jesus. He said whom? Something happened in his his encounter with Jesus that the logos of the kingdom took a hold of him. Mm -hmm. Right? So listen now. That who he who had become impure had now become pure with one encounter. What did he say? Lord, come on. Mm -hmm. If you're struggling to read it, 
pull that choking thing off of you now, right? This is the time to let go. Look at what he says again. The what? Yeah. To whom? Come on, come on, slow down, slow down. To whom? Whom was the rich guy who had all the other qualifications supposed to bless? The poor. And he went away sad. There is nothing here that says Jesus told Zacchaeus to do it. When the Logos takes hold of us, nobody has to tell us because we are being guided by the Logos of the kingdom. You see? So, the half of my goods I give to whom? The poor. And, come on, that's a big end. Right? And if I have defrauded anyone of, oh my gosh, I restore it, Selah. This is true repentance. This is true repentance. Do you remember when we started? I'm closing now, don't worry. Do you remember when we started, I said, the longer I dig into this simple text, the more perplexed I become, the more disturbed I become. Because, to be honest with you, when I got converted, and I come from the old days, when you really had to pull your hair back, those of you who have hair, you had to pull it back. All like Mary and Kenya and them couldn't wear their hair like that. It had to be in a bun up and pull back tight, tight. They couldn't wear pants. You had to wear your skirt right down, sweeping the floor, and long sleeves, and you had to cover your head, and your your thing had to be till up here. I come from that background. You almost be saying he's a true liberal now. <laughs> Excuse me. But when, from that background, we were told that once you're forgiven, that is it. We were not taught this path of demonstrating repentance. Because when you come to Jesus, all your sins are wiped clean. And now Jesus is showing us that when you truly have an encounter with him, nobody has to tell you. You practice it of your own because the logos of the kingdom is at work in our lives. Now what I'm not telling any of you to do is to leave here and go home and say, oh my gosh, let me see... Um, I, I, I owe this person and I, I robbed that person. I did that. That's not what I'm saying to you. If, if you're hearing that, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm trying to help us to understand is that the Logos bears fruit in our lives and that fruit is manifested in the way we treat each other, in the way we treat the people out in the world, in our confirming increasingly to what the word of God says about us. That's what I want you to understand. Now if the Lord speaks to you to do anything else. That's between you. Now notice I'm pointing all my fingers now. That's between y'all. And him. Selah. I don't think I need 